morning and old brother's son just shook his finger to tell you the new day's begun. Open your window and listen to the summer air for oh, melody, melodies everywhere. Melody, melody is everywhere. The world is waiting to tell you of a million things. The shout of daybreak, the flutter of the robin's wings. Come out and listen, there's magic for all to share for oh, melody, melody is everywhere. So <laughs> God made all chillin' from laughter, so don't close your heart. The song of God won't be finished till you've sung your part. This world's a temple, and all in it's a time of prayer. God made us all. La la la, 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 la
young Barbara Lonnay, little Kathy went dancing, her heart was so gay. La 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 lee, Barbara Lonnay, little Kathy went dancing, her heart was so gay. The topic this morning is the idea of what do you need for spiritual growth? We focused it a little bit. The words were, you know, do you need a teacher? But the real question behind that is, how do we grow? What are the obstacles? And how do we overcome them? That's what we spoke about yesterday. I was meditating both last night and this morning just on the, um, just the, the fascinating and interesting variety of everybody's responses yesterday and how everybody was tuned into their own reality from a certain angle and then just seeing the same picture, but we're all, we're all standing at a different part of the circle. Often when we think about our spiritual growth, we think about it in some way linear, that we're starting here and we're going to end up here. In the United States, there was something called the Oklahoma Land Rush, which was part of our history, when the, the west of the United States was first being developed and there was all this huge amount of open land. There were times when, the, especially in Oklahoma, where you could, uh, you could find land and claim it. And of course, for people trying to get started in life, to own your own land was so powerful. And so they had these times, they must have been ex extremely exciting, well, on a certain day and time, everybody would line up on their horses or in their wagons, and they would just, the, the signal would be given, probably with a pistol shot, and everybody would r race out to this designated territory, and you could find a piece of land, and it would be yours. And you would be, you know, fighting to get the best piece, and good heavens, what a rough and tumble way to do things. But nonetheless, that was it, and people were able to establish their lives, even for future generations, doing that. But that's a, a competition. There's only so much. And there's a starting point, and everybody gets their starting point, and some win and some lose. And that's sort of the way it goes. And we have a whole lot of these very linear images in our minds. I start from stupidity, I gradually let, get less stupid, you know, then it all works out. And then there's always people who are more stupid than I, and there are people who are less stupid than I. And I'm always measuring, and I'm always thinking about these different realities. And it, it causes us to have a lot of pressure on ourselves. This, I think the worst thing that we do in a spiritual way is we're always weighing and measuring. Measuring against some imaginary ideal, and almost invariably coming up short. How could we not come up short? 
In fact, many years ago when I started on the spiritual path, which was in the late 60s and in the 70s, it was a, I was part of the big awakening in America, the hippie movement, and you know, it had some more unsavory elements, but overall it was really lots of fun. And we you know, just kind of broke open our whole society, our whole, our whole generation just took a, a, a turn to the left. As one of my, the friend of one of my parents said, you know, every family lost one child. <laughs> and she was honest enough to say it was usually the brightest child in the family who just decided that the way things were was not the way they were going to go. Of course, a lot of people experimented for a while and then went right back in. Um, or the next generation. I was laughing. A friend of mine, he was actually an attorney who was, we were involved with him on a, a, a messy case. And he was, I, we were telling him about our history and our community and all that, and he spoke of his stockbroker, whose name was, I believe, M. M. B. Goldberg was his stockbroker's name. And he, the, insur- the attorney was quite wealthy, I know, because we were paying his fees. And he, uh, <laughs> he remarked that over the course of many years, he'd given the stockbroker really hundreds of thousands of dollars, and he finally said, look, after all our association, why don't you tell me what MB stands for? And so the guy sort of looked at the ground and he said, (laughs) Moonbeam. And he had been born on a hippie commune up somewhere in in a teepee, and that's what his parents named him. And then as soon as he got old enough, he became a stockbroker. You know, (laughs) he just had it with all of that. (laughs) But I was on the other side, and I was one of the few who stayed with the story and found the serious thread in it, which is where I'm standing now. But in those early days when it was all just who knows what, I remember there was an article appeared that in one of the local journals, and it was called The Dark Side of Meditation. And you know, we were very interested, the dark side of meditation, what is this going to speak of? And it was a very interesting article, actually, in the end, because it talked about the fact that many people who are drawn to the meditative life, to self-development, are very intense, determined people. Whether that manifests in your career or how it may manifest, but still, there has to be some strong inner drive. Just as the song that uh, Dambara and Tandava were singing for us, dare to be different, dare to be free, dare to really soar in a different direction. This is not what the whole planet is doing. This is not what you read in the daily journal. This is you know, this is just not what's happening. It's not as obscure as it used to be. In just my short lifetime, the whole world has shifted. But still, it's still not the common path. But sometimes we take that determination for excellence or um, to do, I know a few people mentioned, you know, having so many projects, so many ideas, such a desire to, to really fulfill one's own destiny. One has a sense either of, of God-given talent or potential, or compassion, and you, you want to fulfill it. Why would we not? Why would we want to just take the gifts and the potential we have and just fritter it away on the sand? But with that can come this feeling of anxiety, of am I good enough? Am I really going to succeed? Am I really going to use what I have? Do I have the ability? All of these enormous stories. And then you get into a practice like meditation, depending on what door you come in. Some meditation practices are are not much more than a good relaxation method. And I don't object to that. God knows we're pretty tense. And the capacity to relax is worth quite a lot. Even to just get a break every once in a while from the monkey mind is something to be devoutly sought after, which is why people watch television and drink beer and all the other things they do is just because just being myself is more than I can handle. Sometimes I actually have to stand back a little bit from that thought because if I, if I think too long about the fact that I'm always going to be conscious and I'm always going to be conscious of being me, I can get real freaked out. So I just have to go and do something else because it's so inescapable. And actually when I look back at what motivated me from the beginning. It was trying, trying to escape not myself, but the confinement of myself. Just this feeling of uh, the walls. 
so you get if you get into a, a really elevated me- meditation practice, which is what I represent and what these masters represent, where the promise to you is infinity. It's not merely, as somebody said, when somebody came to our, our beginning meditation course in the temple that we have, the temple and teaching center that I have in, we have in California, and they, they sort of, uh, they took the first course twice, which some people do anyway, because they just feel they, it serves them better. But when they started it the second time, they said, you know, these were the exact words, I just came here to dump a little stress. That's how the guy put it. I just came to dump a little stress, and wow, I've discovered there's a lot going on here. So he wanted to start over with a different attitude, because we promise self-realization. We promise freedom. Not everybody wants that, bear in mind. Somebody also came to our temple and, and said, after coming for a number of months, actually, sort of with wonder, this man said to me, you know, everybody talks about getting over the ego, but you guys really mean it. <laughs> because oftentimes people use that vocabulary, but all they actually mean is to make it work better. Because if you're not in relationship to God, or however you want to call that, but if you're not in relationship to a conscious, powerful force that is bigger than you, really all you're doing is just trying to get more effective in imposing your own will on the world. And that's a huge difference than trying to harmonize your will with the divine infinite force which is already in motion, trying to become an instrument of a greater power which is already there, is very different than trying to suck pieces of that into your story so you can be more powerful at what you're doing. That's progress, actually. Even to to relate your small self to a greater self, even if your intention is selfish, is still at least you've begun to realize that the parameters of reality are bigger than you thought. Which is why, oddly enough, some powerful evil people, strange as that may sound, may actually be more advanced than some souls, as Swami Kriyananda said, who don't yet have the energy to sin, okay? (laughs) Or the courage to sin, that within themselves, sin, I use that word slightly as a joke, but, and because we're not of that, or that kind of dogma. But the point being, we are what we are, and merely looking good is not actually the same as being free. And it may just be, literally, that once you begin to get more energy, you don't actually look better, you actually do look worse. Because now everything in you is illuminated and begins to come to the surface. Well, going back to the dark side of meditation, so I don't leave you in unbearable tension as to what it might be, (laughs) what this article said, quite simply, is now all of a sudden we're not merely trying to be good, we're trying to be perfect. Be ye therefore perfect, as your Father in heaven is perfect. When Jesus said that, that was just, he was just telling us what our assignment was. It wasn't a commandment, and it wasn't a promise or anything like that. It was just, this is what your life assignment is. Nothing less than that, and it's very simple. It's not a question of God needing that from you. He's fine, and the masters are just fine. They don't need anything from us. Yogananda often would comment, God doesn't need our love, he's just fine. He's love itself. He doesn't need us to tell him how glorious he is and how marvelous he is and how much we love him. It's we who need to turn our direction in gratitude, appreciation, and true comprehension because in doing that, we put ourselves in right relationship to reality. We all instinctively understand that. That's why we're so afraid. We're so afraid because underneath it all, we recognize that we're absolutely powerless, aren't we? I mean, just think how many different things happen. I was uh, speaking, your name just went right out of my head. Claire. Claire, yes, of course. I was speaking to Claire about emigrating from the continent of Africa to New Zealand. Oh, I said politics, government, economics, you know, the story is known. It's just a life is established in one way, rightly or wrongly, the politics of it are unimportant. But sincerely, and and many sincere people are going along in a certain way, and everything just shifts. I mean, technology these days is just taking people just right out of the picture. You know, just whole industries just dissolve. 
Every time I see something happen, I, in my own mind, I think of all the implications. I live in uh, the Silicon Valley in California. We pride ourselves in being very advanced and very ecological. And recently, the little town I'm in, um, it's not a little town, but the town I live in, uh, banned all plastic bags. It was, it's one of, been one of the most amazing social shifts that I've ever seen that happened so fast. I mean, now you walk out of a department store and if you forgot your bag, you're just carrying your new clothes in your hands like this. I mean, like a thief, just walking out. <laughs> but just somehow the whole world was ready for it. I was, I'm thinking about all the families that have been manufacturing plastic bags. I mean, talk about a secure profession. And now vaporize. It's probably in China anyway. But still, just these just little movements like this. And we just know what, what power do we have over it. That's why I was saying last night, we waste so much energy rebelling against that which can't be changed. And a lot of it is a good rebellion. Why are they like this? Why don't they see this? But we have to learn to shift the first step. And I spoke last night of the little bird's allegory, going into the state of rebellion, revolt. The second stage is called the revolt. And what happens is we run up against the fact that we just don't know over and over and over again. I'm going to go back and just say the dark side of meditation is <laughs> that if we're trying to be perfect, wow, that gives us a reason to be stressed all the time, doesn't it? You know, now we can just always feel inadequate. There's just never a time that we don't get to feel that we haven't really quite made the grade. And that begins to really eat at people. And you know, one of my friends, literally, she had to stop meditating because she just couldn't get that out of her head. She told me, poor dear, she was always trying so hard to achieve when she meditated. This was such a cute story. This is the way God plays with us. She was meditating early one morning and uh, she lived in a little rented cottage and she was meditating in her meditation room and for the first time, she actually had a phenomenal experience. She meditated as a rule with these uh, sound, sound, uh, sound cutting headphones, you know, that people use on gun ranges and things like that, which is a very um, allowable cheat. It's very helpful. If you can shut out sound, it interiorizes it. So she was meditating like that so she couldn't hear the ambient noise. There was all this wonderful flashing light. She had such a great meditation, flashing light, something finally happening, I'm finally getting somewhere. Later that day, her landlord came and said, you know, I was out there trying to fix your hot water heater early this morning. <laughs> I hope that I didn't disturb you. He'd been in the dark with his flashlight. <laughs> right outside her room. <laughs> That's how um, God plays with us. Sometimes he plays in more heartbreaking ways, but it's, it's still amusing when you finally stand back. But in any case, let me, let me now find where I was trying to go. Oh, yes. Um, we, we have this idea of what it's supposed to look like. And that idea is just, who knows where it comes from? It comes from past lives, it comes from wrong associations as children, it just comes from, you know, uh, spiritual indigestion, from reading a lot of different things, from half understood teachings. And, you know, we have such a capacity to shift reality slightly to um, conform with our prejudices. I mean, even very intelligent people, as you well know, can just hold very prejudicial ideas, and you, you really wonder how they get there. Yogananda has a principle, it's very simple, reason always follows feeling. And I used, these are among the many things that I had to put on the shelf for a long time because I was so rebellious against that idea having been raised with a lot of confidence in my intelligence and raised quite one-sidedly in terms of intellect versus intuition versus feeling. And I was just way too enamored of my own thoughts. One of my early spiritual friends, she used to serve me by every time she would see me thinking too much, which is uh, one of the things that some of you mentioned, a few of you, she would just look at me just out of nowhere and she would say, Asha, you're doing it again. Stop. What? 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 She said, just thinking too much. And I used to wonder, how could you think too much? 
I mean, this is a God-given capacity to be able to understand, to reason, to read, to remember. How could it be too much? But what she meant was too much out of balance. Because if we really want something to be true, it's very, very difficult for us to really tell whether it is or it isn't. Reason always follows feeling. Now, I, I, I mean, feeling like, feeling, uh, e there's a distinction that's just a, almost an arbitrary one, but it, for conversation in English, it has to be made. Our true nature is pure feeling, which is, in a, a more sophisticated metaphysical way, our true nature is bliss. And there's a, a Sanskrit word, sat chid ananda, which is a, a, a perfect translation of the word God in English. The word God in English has no meaning until we give it meaning. If you think about it, you know what church do you belong to? If you belong to a church, that tells what kind of God you believe in. There's the Catholic dogmas. A lot of people who grew up Catholic, for some reason, end up at Ananda. We have a very high percentage of Jews and Catholics. It's a little bit out of proportion to the national population. Who knows why? I think it's Jews because Jews are independent thinkers and tend to be in the forefront of things. Is that a little chauvinistic? Maybe, but anyway, there it is. <laughs> and Catholics, I think, because of the devotion. But sometimes among my, and they almost are all Irish Catholics, if you kind of poke them in the wrong place, they'll start reciting the catechism for you. And I've watched them, <laughs> you know, <laughs> just, you know, these adult people will just start telling you what they memorized as children, and they, five or six of them, they'll all just go with these, <laughs> with this stuff, which is so far out of my world. I, I find it fascinating. Every so often when I first saw them do it, I would poke them again to see if they would do it again. <laughs> but, you know, then you start defining, this is what God means, this is what sin is, this is how salvation happens. I'm probably misrepresenting it. I apologize to all my dear Irish Catholic friends, but it's defined for you, you accept it. And maybe you also feel it. Maybe you do, maybe you don't, but that's what it is. Spirituality is completely the opposite. Spirituality is just something that you find first, somehow from your own perception or your own powerful inner need I was so bewildered as a child because I just didn't understand why everybody didn't feel as urgently as I did this desire to make sense out of this story. I, as a, about the time I was telling my parents that the die was cast, about that age, I remember standing at the big picture window in the front of our house and just looking across at the, the neighbor over there who was mowing his lawn. You know, these odd things come to you. And he was mowing his lawn, and I just had this feeling that he was a, the whole scene was a thin curtain over something else. And I, I remember just intently staring out that window, thinking if I just stared hard enough, that somehow that veil would part. And I knew it was true, but I couldn't make it happen. You know, we all, we all know better than we're able to live. And I mean, that was actually a very sophisticated idea that I had. That's the whole concept of Maya, the veil of illusion, the, the, the magician who makes this world seem like the whole thing, when in fact there's a very different story going on behind it. The, direct, the cosmic director has a very complicated play going on. As Yogananda put it in one place, the plot is really very simple. But he confuses, he confuses us with a whole series of intricate subplots that cause us to go off in all these different directions. And so we, we get, and this is where I was beginning, we get this idea that here I am and here's the goal and it's just this straight line and that's just the way it goes. But in fact, it's a very winding path that all of us follow. If we could just think of squiggles and caterpillars and... Uh, uh, paramecium and you know just amoebas just going in all direction and then our own little trajectory just following through and crossing others and crisscrossing like this and we never can really tell just from looking at it uh, and in a linear sort of way who's ahead who's behind who's winning who's not winning 
The world gives us those stories. If you're rich, if you're famous, if your family looks like this, if your home looks like that, that's what success looks like. But the fact of the matter is, the only measure of success at all is the freedom and the joy that we have in our hearts. And this is where I was saying a few moments ago, Sat Chit Ananda, ever existing is what that means, Sat, ever existing, ever conscious, ever new bliss. That word ever, ever new is a very important part of that definition too, because it's always satisfying to us when we are in tune with that subtle vibration which is our true nature. And all of these personalities and so on are very important. And all of these adventures that we go through are very important. We can't just dismiss them. I had had to learn this myself and I've done my best to help other people. Someone will sit down in front of me and they'll say, well, you know, I know this is stupid. I know it's dumb to feel this way. I know it's silly for me to think like this. No, it's not at all silly. And it's it's embarrassing to, to remember it, but getting over our embarrassment is part of what the spiritual path is all about. You've spent incarnations getting this confused. <laughs> you have devoted all of your intelligence to getting this confused. You know, it's not like we get here casually. In the Bible, when Jesus was praying um, to God to create a different destiny, and bear in mind, Jesus wasn't concerned about himself. But he had come with this liberating message to his disciples and to that time and place. He was drawn by his own compassion and sent by God. Every master has equal freedom of consciousness. Every master perceives the same infinity. I mean, think about it. How could there be more than one infinity? They all see the same truths, regardless of what the, the institutions do with it later. The masters have a pure revelation, it's complete, and they, but they can only give as much as people can receive. That's why St. John in the Bible says, as many as received him, to them gave he the power to become the sons of God. Become the son of God meant to become a Christ, to become self-realized. Same message that Jesus delivered. He was not saying, I'm the only one, he was saying, I am the only path. I am the only goal. My consciousness is your consciousness, and that's what you're seeking. That's what he was trying to say. Then the lesser minds over many centuries get a hold of the whole thing, and finally you can poke a Catholic and he'll tell you the catechism, <laughs> you know, <laughs> because it was memorized. But each master comes with this power to give us the, f the fullness of their reality. And uh, when Jesus was in the garden and he was praying, you know, let them understand rather than misunderstand because those who had worldly power were correctly very threatened by what he presented. And it was all happening in the context of their own religious institutions. And those who had taken that religious organization and turned it into egoic power were, were, knew that they would be destroyed by this inner reality that Jesus was bringing. So the whole drama played itself out as it's played itself out countless times. So when Jesus was praying, you know, let this cup pass from me, it wasn't that he himself needed it. He could step in and out of his body. He could feel the pain of the body or not. He was, a, he was a true master. When you study the teachings of Jesus from the yogic side, where the understanding is more profound than what is offered in the, in the bare-faced scripture or in the church, you really realize what was happening there. He was praying for his disciples. He was praying for the devotees. You know, let this pass. But then he says, well, he says two things that are very important. One is, he, first he says, this is my opinion, Lord. This is what I think would be great, that this whole scenario just shift at this point. After having stated himself honestly and courageously, he says, but thy will be done. And that is the perfect prayer. Because if we pretend 
at the beginning they were all for God's will, most of the time we're not telling the truth because we just have a preference. We have a preference for, our, for the familiar, for the pleasurable, for a continuation of whatever it is that we're in. We just think it would be nicer if we didn't have to work so hard or have to have our heart broken so many times. It's only natural to feel that way. I was speaking last night about how tender-hearted Swami Kriyananda was. Some of the songs that he sang, I, maybe we'll sing John Anderson tonight. It's the, it's the musical version of this uh, Robert Burns poem about this couple you know, spending their life together and then death comes. And it's really, when Swamiji wrote it, he wasn't writing it romantically. He was thinking of all the life that so many of us in our community have lived together and what an adventure it's been. Every so often toward the end, Swami would sort of look at us and say, my, you've all aged. <laughs> you know, I knew you when you were 20, and now look at you. You're gray-haired. I, this is just a small thing, but I remember at one point Swamiji had this idea that he really needed to be sure that he stepped aside soon enough so that other people would have a chance to really take leadership, which he actually did beautifully. But at one point he sort of laid out this plan of how it was going to work, and the man he was speaking to said, well, that sounds just wonderful. I'll be 75 by the time I have authority. <laughs> and Swami said, oops, I better speed up this plan a little bit. Because he just, he never could cognize us really at, at any age at all. But, but truthfully, we were all children compared to him. I was going on a boat ride once with him and, to a, and another woman, and I called up to get the tickets. How many adults, how many children? You know, I was maybe 40 at the time. I almost said, you know, one adult, two children. But I knew when we came up with our half-price tickets, they wouldn't let us use them. <laughs> so I had to kind of cross my fingers and say three adults. <laughs> but there was only one adult and then two children. It was just the way it was, because that's the way it is. Now, coming back to wherever I was, let me see if I can find it. Um, so... Um, I did go on a long tangent there, and let me find the main thread again. Mm -hmm, I wonder what it was. Oh yes, that prayer, thank you. I was waiting for you to speak up, I knew you would know. <laughs> um, the other part of it though, after that part of the prayer, which I, I, I think it's very important for us to understand that. Also, I'm gonna finish, stay there for a minute longer. You know, if Jesus could be so honest, what, what is the necessity to be that honest? You have to realize that you're not fooling anyone. The divine knows your heart. The master lives inside of you. God lives inside of you. The spirit is within you. Who are we trying to fool? I went through a long cycle with Swami Kriyananda, several years long. I had this job. I was completely incompetent, totally incompetent in that job. And I didn't understand how you became competent. I thought you had to just be competent. I didn't realize you could learn to be competent. He was trying to teach me very important lessons. So I had to always just pretend that I had it together and it was a mess, total mess. And it went on for a couple of years until it just reached a crisis point. That was when Swami, one of the times, he said to me, how are you? I said, I don't know, how am I? <laughs> he said, not well. <laughs> I said, okay, that's how I'm feeling too. <laughs> but he just said to me so simply, you never fooled me. I'd been working so hard to keep the facade up. They just said, you never fooled me. Do you think we ever fool anyone? When people are pretending an attitude around you, are you ever fooled? Rarely. But if people keep up a false front that prevents you from relating to their reality, do you think it's different internally in your relationship with whatever you want to call it, God, your superconscious self, your own master? That's why G John said that. If you open yourself, then you can be transformed. If you decide, no, I'm just going to do it my way, it doesn't matter to the masters in the sense that it, it doesn't hurt them. Their, their journey is finished. They're just here to guide us up the mountain. And if we say, no, I'd rather just die in the snow cave then take the path that you're pointing out. They just let us die in the snow cave. Because unless it's truly our own, that's, that's just it. We have to wait. So Jesus modeled it right there. You know, I want it this way. I'm going to be honest about this. I had to pray. 
I've prayed in my life. I couldn't even pray to want God's will because I didn't. It was just very simple. I wanted my will. So the honest answer was, I really don't want this, but I would want to want this. I even had to, sometimes add several wants. I would want to want to want this because I know the right answer, but I'm just not there yet. And so the, the rest of what Jesus said is, save me from this hour, he declared. The, the heartbreaking realization as he was going to be crucified, he stood and he said, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, I would have gathered thee like a mother hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but ye would have it not. And he wasn't talking really to the Jews or to the country or to the city. He was just saying again and again the light comes and you don't want it. So you have to suffer again and it hurts the heart of a master. It doesn't affect his consciousness, but it hurts the heart of a master. But Jesus said, save me from this hour, but for this hour was I born. I mean, when you hear that and you really tune into the story, the life of Christ to me is so alive. I, I'm sure I was on the streets of Jerusalem. I don't think I played a major role, but I think I stood in the doorway and watched the drama because it just, to me, it's not an ancient story. It's like it happened yesterday to people I love and it's very human. I don't mean it's less divine, but it's very real. But then he says, for this hour was I born. And one of my friends once converted that, and I've always remembered. And he looked at everyone in the room, right here, right now, this minute, for this hour were we all born. All of our incarnations, all of the striving in this life, every bit of worldly and spiritual effort we've ever made, this is it right now and therefore there's enormous importance now i'm not trying to give you the dark side of meditation oh my god what comes next i don't mean that i just mean we have to take ourselves very seriously and don't imagine in the slightest way that you can just dismiss anything any desire any delusion any aspiration any confusion don't ever Call what you feel, silly or stupid. For this hour were you born. You worked a long time to bring yourself right to this point. And now you have to apply that same committed energy to going in whatever direction now looks like the true direction for you. But we do come to a point when we realize, you know, the equipment that I have just myself is just not quite enough. Swami Kriyananda became a disciple of Yogananda in 1948 after reading Autobiography of a Yogi. Now, many people read Autobiography of a Yogi or see Yogananda's picture or one of the other masters and they have a moment like that. In fact, Swami Kriyananda wrote an autobiography which is on our table there. It's called The New Path. And he, meaning this is a new path, this is a new expression of an infinite truth. And he tells the story of, of seeing the book Autobiography of a Yogi, not buying it the first time he saw it, even though he was very drawn to Yogananda's picture, a few days later remembering that book. It was after he put his mother on the boat to Egypt to join his father, meaning that he was completely without any external influence. His father was a geologist for Standard Oil and had been posted to Cairo. His father had gone ahead and then that morning he put his mother on the ship and she went away and he was completely free of any family influence. And then he was walking down the street and he remembered Autobiography of a Yogi and he remembered Yogananda's face. And he still resisted and then he literally found himself turned to buy the book. He didn't make the decision. Something else made the decision. And as soon as he realized that, he ran to buy the book. He read it in a few days. He got on a bus from New York to Los Angeles, the whole width of the United States, walked in to see Yogananda and said, I want to be your disciple. And Swami himself said he never imagined saying those words to anyone. He was a brilliant, self-directed, you know, artistic, capable person who had just never thought and for several reasons, he explained. First, he said, how can anyone else help you find the truth? Truth has to be an internal realization. 
And he, he thought it was an impossible contradiction of personal integrity to have a teacher or a guru especially who somehow would participate in that with you. So he was philosophically confused. And then the other point was very simple. He'd never met anyone he thought could teach him. So he couldn't imagine, you know, becoming the, even hardly the student, what to speak of, the disciple of someone who didn't have something perceivably real to offer to him. But he said when he read Autobiography of a Yogi, he, he, he said himself, much of the book absolutely bewildered him. This was 1948. There was just no context. He'd never even heard the word guru. But he said there was so much integrity in that book, and it just opened up a universe that he did not know was there, but that intuitively he recognized. And he just made the decision like that. And his parents were thousands of miles away at a time when even long-distance phone calls were different. And it was two years before they got back to the United States, and by then it was way too late. <laughs> you know, this was God's way. But when Swamiji was writing his autobiography, which is in the 1970s, that was just before, that was the last book he wrote before he got a computer. He was, he's an what they call an early adopter, an early adapter. He always would get the, the newest technology right away. But he didn't have a computer. It was the last book he did. And I was his secretary, so I typed that book, typed it and retyped it. He is a prodigious edi editor. He doesn't just write. He edits and edits. And so I retyped those pages over and over again for him. I was very sorry when he got a computer. But anyway, it was great fun. And when I read that story, when we were, when he was final, doing the final editing, I remarked, I said, sir, in a certain way it's unfortunate that your story is so emphatic and so dramatic because it happens, it happens that way for almost no one. Almost no one has the karma or the courage. I mean, it doesn't mean that no one does because some of you in this room, I know you've had the same instant recognition, but it doesn't happen that way for most people. You know, God doesn't take your parents and send them to Egypt so that you'll be completely free like that. And Swami himself said, I know, he said, it is unfortunate in a certain way. He said, but that's how it's happened, so what can I say? And that was the story. I myself didn't like autobiography when I first read it. I had no sense of recognition and I didn't even care for the book very much. It was too phenomenal. I was very austere and all of this divine mother miracle stuff. I just, I couldn't relate to it. I related to Swami Kriyananda because he was so grounded and so authentic and so resonated. And then he was very enthusiastic about Yogananda. So I thought, well, I'll give it another try. I had a, an instantaneous recognition with him also. I mean, in the same way that he did with Master. But still, we just, we are, we are the apex of whatever it is that we're working out, because that's the story, that's the journey that we're all on. I really appreciated Bernie's saying, you know, my self-definition is that I'm on a journey. I think that's a beautiful way to think about it, because that is the most open-ended possible way, which is I'm standing where I'm standing, but I haven't, I, this is not my final resting place. I'm in motion. I'm making the painting, and don't judge it because it's not finished. And that's how we have to think about this. And don't even try to judge it in front of others because who knows even what the final thing is supposed to look like yet. You know, we haven't gotten there yet. The little child who's drawing a, a picture intently, the teacher says, what are you drawing a picture of? She says, I'm drawing a picture of God. The teacher says, no one knows what God looks like. They will in a few minutes. <laughs> you know, we don't know what the finished product is going to look like being me. All we know is the knot that we're standing in. And the journey of the soul is a fascinating one. I've mentioned the allegory that we have in the Festival of Light, where the little bird revolts. It, it, it makes up its own mind about what's going to work. It makes up its own plan. This is how things are. It ought to be like this. It isn't. I'm mad about it. I'm having a tantrum. My friend's son was a uh, very uh, 
He did not like being a child. Being a child was a really annoying experience for him because he just couldn't do all the things that he wanted to do, and so he had a lot of tantrums. And his mother was, you know, reason, uh, she learned to deal with it, and when he would go into one of his tantrums, she would just carry him into his room and put him in his room and close the door on him and let him finish. And so he was having his tantrum, and it got quiet, and she opened the door and said, Honey, are you done? And he said, Not quite, Mommy. <laughs> and then so she shut the door, and he screamed for a little bit longer, and then he was finished. This is exactly how God watches us. We have our little tantrum. We're always having tantrums, if you really think about it. I want it to be morning. I want it to be different. I want people to understand. I want them not to behave this way. Make the list. It goes on and on. And that's the revolt. And the next stage after that is called the quest. And the quest is just a gorgeous place because we recognize that there is something that I don't know that I can learn. We don't yet know what it is. We're not firmly established in it. But we know what, we know, we've learned how to learn. And the shift is not even in our thinking, it's in our intonation. Because in the revolt, we say, God, what are you doing? Like this. And in the quest, we say, God, what are you doing? And when we ask it like that, you see how much is possible? And we started out, you see, we never lose our connection with the divine, we just get distracted. We're sent out, we're on this mission, we're going to remember our divine heritage, we're going to be a perfect instrument of that heritage, and then, wow, look at those flowers, and what about that Ferrari, and what a gorgeous house, and wow, what a beautiful woman. And isn't that child adorable? And, and then we're just off. And it's not even that we've, it's not that we've, we're not doing something evil. We're just a little confused. Because it isn't as if it's not part of the divine plan for us to play all that out. But what happens to us is we begin to mistake the temporary for the eternal. And instead of drawing our true sustenance from the eternal, we start getting our happiness from the temporary. And the problem is, it's just not how we're made, and it's not how creation is made. And nobody's doing anything to us, it's just we're trying, and then we try to get God to break his own laws. This is how Yogananda puts it. So many prayers are, I know that there are consequences of this behavior. I know that certain things have to happen. But can't you just change the rules for me? Hmm, how about that? Just make an exception for me, right? Because everything that happens to us is a necessary learning. Not so that we suffer, but so that we learn how to transcend suffering. Is that an easy assignment? No, not at all. That's why very few people go on the serious quest. That's why that man said to me, everybody talks about transcending the ego, but you all really mean it. It's, 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 a, 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 it's not even a giving up. It's an expanding from. I, uh, I was heckled once in a talk I was giving. This man accused me of abandoning my own heritage. I mean, he was just nobody. I don't know. He was one of those people who felt it was his job to correct the entire world. So he accused me of abandoning my own culture and all of this thing. I said, I haven't abandoned anything. I've taken everything that I am, everything that I learned, and I've just made the picture bigger and bigger and bigger. So it isn't that we can't love our children or delight in our beautiful home or, you know, do creative things or serve the world. It's just what context are we living in? You know, are we doing all of that in order to reunite ourselves with that divine flow? Or are we doing all that so that we can gather for ourselves and make this tiny little helpless thing secure, finally? And we never learn except through experience. You don't try to teach a five-year-old how to do algebra. They just can't do it. And you don't talk to them about philosophy that's beyond them. And so God teaches us exactly where we're standing. 
And whatever lesson you're wearing is your perfect lesson. I hate that, but it's true. (laughs) Whatever it might be, whatever it might be, however it looks to you, for this hour were you born. And from this hour will you find your own glorious destiny. Now, we're going to take a breather. Okay. And then we'll come back. We'll have a little music. I'll let you ask questions if you like. If you prefer to put a question into the basket, and I know some of you have, which I am relating, I will relate to those. Please do that. So let's take, you know, five minutes, ten maybe, if you want to get a cup of tea. So this is a song about courage. It's the scene is in Ireland, and uh, Mara. No, I've never been to. Love to go. Talk to you about that later. And Tara was the seat of the kings of Ireland at one point, so it kind of talks about our own greatness in that sense. Tara's grave hill so quiet the day I came back. Not a green leaf stirred on the air. Not a bird did proclaim ancient grandeur and fame. Only ruins faint memories declare. I marvel to think how can greatness ere die? How can song disperse in the sky? How can hopes and dreams fade? How the warrior sharp blade? Become dust was victory a lie. I stood there and pondered the great deeds of men's past. How, like clouds in the sunset, no glory can last. Even we, as we labor to achieve some bright end, must accept after glory that the night will descend. I've dreamed a broad rainbow over thicket and thorn, over crag, clouds, crags, clouds and crags, rather. Over crags that called Terry, your hopes are forlorn. All too oft in my dreaming, courage turned to despair. Till I learned that success is but the courage to dare. As I gazed and thought sadly of Tara's demise, suddenly I saw her walls rise, saw her long regal halls, heard her people's brave calls, as though time had doffed skies. And I knew in that moment the deeds that men do never die. Each victory is true. Every effort we spend gives more strength in the end till our gladness in life's ever new. Every effort we spend gives more strength in the end till our gladness in life's ever new. And this is one of the songs that Swami Priyananda dubbed as Ananda's theme song. Walk like a man. Whether you're a man or a woman, yourself.
Okay, no small potatoes questions here. <laughs> Decided to ask some real humdingers. Okay, maybe I'll just do something else. <laughs> kiwi yeah, Kiwi ingenuity. Wowie zowie. Um, d does anyone have anything they want to ask in person, or did everybody write their questions down? Before I 
continue using your questions as the skeleton because I might as well. Um, <coughs> I, I would not in any way say that our intention in coming to New Zealand or being here with all of you is to try to um, convert you in any respect to anything in particular. As I explained last night, we, have, we put the masters here because this is who we are and this is where the power comes from. And you may use that as you choose. But there is also a disciple. This is a line of disciples. And those who feel drawn to it can continue that wonderful tradition by opening themselves in a more specific way than just a general way. And so tomorrow, when we do our Sunday morning program, at the end of it, we'll also include a simple initiation ceremony for any of you who, would, who feel drawn to make a commitment to anyone or all of this line of masters. Um, this we have on the back table. This is the vow. It's, it looks long, but it's not complex. So you can review this and see if it resonates with you. The decision to make uh, the vow of discipleship is, is a very personal one. And uh, if we were in a different setting, we would give you some more opportunity to have classes and understand it. But here, because we're just coming in and out, um, it's really a matter of your own heart. If you would like to speak to me or any one of those of us who are disciples, in fact, um, that includes Alan and Karen, and oh, who am I missing? Yeah. And, and Angela and Travis. Just ask us about it, what it means and what it might mean to you. Okay? And if anyone, I, I, you know, at lunchtime, come up to me or at the break, don't be, don't be shy about it. And we can see if it would be nice for you. We, we had this ceremony when we were here before, and it's very beautiful, very touching if it's right for you. Okay. Um, so, I guess it can't be put off any longer. <laughs> <laughs> You know, I was touching on it uh, toward the end of what I was saying, or I was more than touching on it, by talking about, for this hour, we'll be born at the place that we stand. The, we set out on this mission. We had certain misunderstandings. Uh, let, me, let me try to find what I'm really meaning to say. When Swami Kriyananda... Uh, in the, earlier in his life, before I knew him, he, when he was a direct disciple, when he was living with Yogananda, and then for the decade after that, Yogananda had uh, a monastery in his own center in Los Angeles, and Swami Kriyananda was a key person in that. He became vice president of that organization. He was in charge of the monks, and he created a training course for disciples that was done by Guru's inspiration, but his own ideas. And he wrote the certain qualities that were required for success on the spiritual path. And the first quality that he listed was the word courage. And it's interesting that Dambara chose the song Tara and Go On Alone. Those are, and even the song, the last one that he was playing, How Much Longer, Lord, Must I Call Your Name? Because courage is really the single salient feature of success in life. Um, several of you spoke of courage or the opposite yesterday, fears. Um, all of us are deeply plagued. And I was saying earlier today, we have this instinctive realization of our own vulnerability. Um, even if we trust and give our hearts um, to other people, we're always a little bit subject to whatever karmic realities they're going to have to go through. And even people with the best of intentions often themselves do not know what their own future holds. And when you give birth to children, Swami Kriyananda is not very sentimental about the course of human life. And he talks about when you give birth to a child, you're inviting a perfect stranger to live in your house for 20 years or so. <laughs> I mean, that's not how most people think about it, I know. But in truth, you have no idea who you're getting. You're just sort of hoping that you'll get somebody that you enjoy having around all that time. But fact of the matter is, you don't always, do you? Or you don't always come in somewhere where you really are happy to be. We're drawn by magnetism 
which is to say we have a vortex of energy that's vibrating in a certain way that matches another vortex. But antipathy can also be a powerful magnetism. And just think how obsessed we become sometime when we're angry about something or mad about someone. We're just caught together, aren't we? I heard a very chilling story, one of those uh, perception of the astral worlds of the world beyond this one, about this woman who had died in a concentration camp with so much hatred for the man who had abused her that she was trapped where he was. Even though her own nature was not as dark as his, her, her obsessive hatred for him linked her to him. Isn't that a scary one? Whoa. Here's another one that a friend of mine, I can't really vouch for the absolute truth of these things, but they are not inconceivable according to the world that I understand, the way I understand the world. These are not my own experiences. There was a man who lived in our community for a time and he, he had this capacity to go into the astral world and he often helped people who were stuck in certain uh, places, vibra vibratory places. And for some reason that I never really got clear from him, he would find those, those people in the astral worlds but in physical places. And so he did, he did a service which he called clearing your house and he would come through where you lived and he would find these places where there were astral beings, not haunting you exactly, but just kind of stuck there. Was that their physical spot at some point? I could never get it. So there was a couple of odd places in the house that I lived in, I invited him in. And he told me this fascinating story about what he found there. And what he found was an American Indian warrior. And the American Indian warrior, he said, in the astral universe was still in his full war regalia he was still sitting on his war horse, and he had been, in, he'd been killed in one of those last battles, which is a big part of American history. I don't know exactly how your, your system went when you were moving the original people out and moving the others in, but our history is very black. And we did terrible things to the American Indians, we meaning the European settlers. And so he had died in one of those last battles, but it wasn't his own death he was mourning. He mourned the death of his daughter that he hadn't been able to save. So he came in and he saw this warrior there, and he also saw his daughter, the warrior's daughter, in a light world above him, trying to get his attention, saying to him, I'm fine. You know, death comes to all of us. You were noble in your efforts, but it just wasn't meant to be. It was over for all of us. But he was so concentrated on his suffering and his guilt and his disappointment that he didn't know she was there. Now, think of the picture. Her love for him, his love for her, but twisted like this. Now, where does that come from? Remember I was talking earlier? I'm the one who knows in my way is the way it's supposed to be. No bigger plan. No idea that someone, as I was saying, has their hand on the loom and is weaving all the threads the, into the pattern that it's supposed to be. And somehow my friend, because of the unique gifts he has, was simply able to get that man to look up. Just to look up. And then he saw his daughter. This whole thing was about his love for his daughter. He saw her, and then immediately he went with her, like that. It's such a sweet story, isn't it? But also, think about all the parts of that. You know, the, the nobility of his intention, but the isolation of his thinking. Is there a pattern to this planet? Do the things that happen to us happen to us in order to transform our consciousness? Is the temporary the eternal? Or is there some other story here? Now, several of the questions that I'm holding in my hands, how do you move through pain and suffering? Someone asked me, um, one asked me about a deep desire that they have to be fulfilled in this life. Will it be fulfilled? I'm not psychic, so I can't say. Another asks um, about, do you send light to someone who has terribly mistreated you? Um, how do you transcend multiple and painful losses? You know, this is where it all comes down to, to, doesn't it, so much of the time. I wish I had a, a quick answer. I don't. And these are not things that somebody can magically get you through. 
Well, that's where the word courage comes from, doesn't it? So this, this is what I'm going to suggest, and this is about how to be on the spiritual path, which is what we're talking about today. The first quality that's required is courage, which is to say, what choice do I have? That's sort of my definition of courage, which is perhaps not a very good definition, but it's the best one that I've been able to come up with. It may not be a question, really, of whether you have courage. The question is, what choice do you have? And what happens to us, and this, I believe, is the divine plan, is that we're pushed into positions where we don't really have a choice, and we can say it's because God is cruel, or this world is terrible, or people are no damn good, which is easy enough to say, or it's because when we're pushed, we discover a strength within ourselves that we didn't know we had. That's how Yogananda describes the purpose of all tests that come in our life, is not to, not to break us, not to wound us, not to torture us, but to awaken within us a power that we didn't know we had. And deeply, on the deepest level, it's to awaken within us an understanding of where power comes from and the fact that we are always in the presence of a benign, loving force that is trying to help us. You know, even just thinking of that American Indian there with his daughter right above him trying to help him. And it is, it's not just the masters that help us, but everyone who transcends this world and goes to the other side always discovers this whole... One man described it, he said, in his death and return experience, he walked into what he described as a whole stadium full of people cheering for him. <laughs> and they were all cheering for him. He didn't even know they were there. But they were all, you know, wanting him to succeed. But success was not whether he got the job or not. Success was whether he learned within himself the greatness of his own being. And whether he learned within himself that, what choice do I have? Because no one suffers from our dark attitude as much as we do. Because we're always living inside our consciousness. That's what I was saying earlier. Sometimes, even though this is my whole life, sometimes I, I get really nervous about that fact that if it's spinning inside of me and it's not spinning well, there really, effectively, is no other reality, is there? It doesn't matter where you go. You, you get yourself into one of those moments and you sort of try to find a place in this universe where it's not happening. I was in a, an earthquake in, San Fran in the San Francisco area where I live. It was the biggest one we've had. We haven't had, we haven't had very many. You know, they, who knows when the big one will come. But this was plenty big enough. It was now 1989. It was quite a long time ago. And I was inside when the building began to shake in this, uh, with these wood frame buildings that we live in, which are good for earthquakes because they have a lot of play. The first thing that occurred to me when the thing began to sway like this was earthquake proof is oxymoronic. There is no such thing. <laughs> if Mother Nature wants to knock the thing down, she just has to keep going and the thing's coming down. There's just no question. And I was there wondering if this was the moment because an earthquake comes out of nowhere and you have no idea if it's going to be, you know, five seconds or five minutes. So my first thought was I need to get out of this building because my perception of where the trouble was was that the building was shaking. So I went outside. It, the relationship was like this. I could just step out a wide door onto the lawn. And then there was this second moment when the ground was shaking. And I so wanted to be somewhere that wasn't shaking. But where could you be? It's the planet Earth that's shaking. I don't have the capacity to turn on my little jet pack and go off of it. It was just absolutely all pervasively everywhere. And my whole concept of reality just shifted. It was fascinating, really. I, was, I wasn't being very brave, but it was fascinating. I watched the swimming pool water just come up like a small tidal wave over the fence and mostly you know, just come down on the lawn next to it. It only lasted maybe 30 seconds, maybe a minute. It wasn't very long, but it was, it was amazing to see how many assumptions we just live with. 
and to also capture that that for a moment the external world completely mimicked the internal world. All I ever have is my consciousness. So when someone asks a question, which is asked here, you know, will I get this desire fulfilled? Or let me, the other one, you know, how much should I forgive? Should I send love to the people who've treated me badly? Questions like that. Well, it's really up to you. There's no should about it. It's just a question of what do you want your own life experience to be? Or as one lovely healer once asked me, well, how is it working for you to just keep being angry like that? How is that serving you? And we always have the same answer. It's really not any fun. And a piece of us keeps imagining that somehow we'll get something we want from this attitude. And we don't ever give up something we're attached to, as, as Gandhi actually even recommended. He said, don't give up a pleasure until you have replaced it with a higher pleasure. And so as long as we're getting something from whatever unpleasant attitude we're putting out, we will just keep having it. And I should feel different. It's stupid to feel this way. None of that really does anything for it because some piece of us just isn't finished, isn't finished with this revolt, isn't finished with this, if I just stay angry at you, this will give me something that I want. And this is the courage of the spiritual path. It's twofold. It's one is that sometimes the only way out is just by absolute sheer grit and determination that we just get up every single day and we make a resolution to make this day better. And at the end of it, when it isn't, we just cross it off the calendar and wake up the next morning as if it was starting all anew. Now, this would be a completely hopeless quest unless we also add to that some picture of reality in which the whole journey is going somewhere. So a great deal of the time, the question isn't really, how do I just dismantle this one terrible thing in my life? It's how do I add something to my life that's not as terrible as this? In other words, we have to change the proportion that this experience has to dominate our life. Because what gives us the power actually to overcome is just seeing it from a different perspective. I remember once I was very angry about something that happened when I was young. I was very angry at someone for behaving very badly, I thought. And in such a way that, well, abuse was not such a popular word this, then, but it, it wasn't, the behavior wasn't the best. And it had impinged on me in ways that were very major. It wasn't physical or sexual or that, that sort of thing that I know some people really have to face, which is tough. It was just the interplay of relationship. But it was interesting to me because as I reflected over a period of time and just would continually, my mind would go back to my, my anger, my frustration, my annoyance. It's like the whole subject gradually refined itself down to just a few points. And then I began to ask a very different question. Why am I so focused on these few points? And then I realized that in those particular instances, I actually had been conscious enough to know that I should have behaved differently. And then I realized that I wasn't really so much angry at that other person. I was mad at myself. Now, of course, if you're a child and so on, it's a different story. But I was really mad at myself for being not having the courage because it was a tough choice. There's a book out there. It's called Ask Asha, which is a series of real questions I was asked by people. So there's a dynamism to that book because I didn't just make up things I wanted to talk about. I really responded to people about things that were actually happening to them. And let me now find this. I can't, now it slips my mind exactly why I was going to say that. But in that book, um, you know, someone was dealing with this same terrible anger at someone for doing something. And it was like, I, you know, it, oh, I know what I was going to say, but it shifted in my mind that I was really angry at myself. And I realized that the person who had mistreated me had not known what they were doing. That doesn't mean they aren't responsible. That's quite different. And that doesn't mean that the karmic retribution inherent in their action won't come to them. 
because if we do things that are out, out of integrity with the divine plan, then it has to be corrected. And th what that means is if we have energy going in a certain direction, it doesn't always happen in the same incarnation because sometimes we can outrun it for a while. Yogananda calls that the conflicting cross current of ego. I mean, instant karma is really good karma because if you make the mistake in the moment and it hits you in the moment, you get it. I was in a, an ancient temple in India, a filthy temple filled with monkeys, but an ancient, very sacred temple. And I was walking around thinking, what a filthy temple this is. And just in our tour guide had, in my opinion, kidnapped us and brought us there. And I was really, really crabby. And I was just, and I was mad at India. I was mad at, you know, everything. I'm walking around with all these thoughts in my mind, and as a result, I didn't notice what I was doing, and I crossed uh, the territory of the monkeys. And this big monkey jumped on my back. <laughs> well, the next part of this I was told later, because I don't clearly remember it. Apparently, to my own credit, in an act of enormous courage, I grabbed the monkey, I threw him off of me. <laughs> Whoa, how about that? That was terrific. And then I said, <laughs> Get off of me, you filthy thing! <laughs> <laughs> then the creature, I was wearing a skirt. Thank God I was wearing a skirt and not trousers. He closed his mouth around my skirt, like this. And then I started, again, yelling at him, let go, let go, like that, until I ripped my skirt out of his mouth. He took a big hole of it like this, by which time the whole temple and all the priests and everybody was there with me, protecting me, you know. The Mem Sahib, you know, cannot be eaten by the monkey. <laughs> this would be really terrible. <laughs> so, um, but it was, it was a fabulous experience, and it was instant karma. And then after that, I thought, do not mess with these ancient temples, girl. <laughs> you look past all oh, whatever you're seeing, there's power in these places. Yeah, and I, you know, I went up to that deity, and I just prostrated myself right on the filthy ground and said, I'm so sorry. <laughs> But it was terrific, because if everything could come to us, bing, bing, like that, we would always know, wouldn't we? But unfortunately, it doesn't work like that, because we are a mixture. We are a mixture of weakness and strength. And oftentimes, isn't it so, you do something to someone? I'm, I'm a very strong person, and over the course of my life, this woman was dying, and she called me up to tell me how she'd had this lifelong struggle with me. Wow. I said, gee, I've always really admired you. I didn't even know. But for her, this big karma had been playing itself out. I mean, I did my best. I went, you know, I went to see her, and we, I, I think she was able to let it go. I'm, I'm certain it was deserved, because I probably did lots of things I didn't know I was doing. You know, we all do. But the force of my personality and my trajectory, so to speak, just caused me to run right past it. And it just took time before it catches up. The way I think of it is like, there's a 12-year-old child who's a bit of a bully. There's a three-year-old on a tricycle. The bully is going down the street. He sees the three-year-old. He's riding his bike. He turns his bike, knocks over the three-year-old, and just sails right on. The three-year-old is wailing. The 12-year-old just waves and just goes on. Let's say they both live in the same town. The three-year-old grows up to be the banker. <laughs> 12-year-old <laughs> now 30 needs a loan, no chance. <laughs> You're never getting that loan from me. 12-year-old doesn't even remember knocking over the 3-year-old. Three 3-year-old three remembers. And this is how our karma works over incarnations. We've got a lot of force going, and those good qualities carry us, but every aberration eventually has to be straightened out. Why? because it disturbs our peace. I mean, all the qualities that everyone was talking about, the anxiety over this, the desire for that, what, what is all that anxiety? What do you think it is? I mean, well, metaphysically, it's the karma that's stored in our chakras that's vibrating at a certain um, rate of consciousness, you might call it. Well, you should call it, because that's what it is. It's a rate of consciousness that is slightly off from pure love, per pure freedom, pure compassion, and it has to be corrected. 
And what is going to force us to correct it? Not generally when it's just an undercurrent, because we're so accustomed to living with those undercurrents, we don't even know they're there. This is normal to us. And this is an extreme case, but I read a fascinating biography of a woman who suffered from schizophrenia. And she, she was a very unusual character, and I think the book was called The Center Can't Hold, if I'm not mistaken. It's a very interesting book for anyone who has an interest in that. I hope that's the actual name of the book. Brilliant woman who was schizophrenic from birth. She just didn't know it. Finally, she got the right medication after accomplishing enormous things in her life anyway. And she said when she was finally medicated in the right way for the first time, she realized, oh heavens, not everyone in the world is struggling all the time just to stay sane. But she'd never experienced anything else. And so in our lives, we live with all this sub, sub, subconscious in the sense of just below the conscious level, agitation. And it's making our lives extremely difficult. But we don't know it. But Divine Mother knows it. And for better or worse, like any loving mother, Master Yogananda always suggested we think of God in the feminine, or encouraged us to think of God in the feminine, not for the sake of women, but for the, f the sake of the approachability that that gives us. As he says on a certain recording, the mother is closer than the father. That the father requires that we meet a certain standard, but the mother always forgives us. But Divine Mother also, like any good mother, wants the best for us. And a good mother doesn't let her child, you know, have a tantrum and get his way. He locks him in his room and waits till he's finished. Because you may think that it's enough. I don't need to go to school, Mommy. I'm just going to stay here and live with you forever. You know, I don't really have to learn to share. Why should I be nice? One of my friends, the little boy, was... Uh, he, he had a big fight with a, another boy in school, and my, the, his parents knew the whole circumstance of that other child's life and knew that child was from a difficult home. So first he just let his son be annoyed, but then later when, at bedtime when the child was more receptive, the father started talking to the son about the other child's difficulties and what he was, you know, he didn't have the same advantages and so on. And he, he encouraged his son to befriend him. And the little boy folded his arms and said, Daddy, I don't want to be that good. <laughs> Just like that. And that is an honest prayer. No, I may have to forgive you someday, but it's not going to be today. But that's an honest prayer, because that says, I'm going to have to do this, I know. Actually, that's the most annoying part of it to me, is that nobody's ever really going to apologize to you in a way that's really going to help. I mean, they might, maybe someday. I was starting to say back in my own experience, at a certain point I realized that I had been conscious of what was happening, but the man who had been misbehaving was not conscious. So how can you hold someone responsible for what they don't even know they're doing? Do you want to be held responsible for what you don't even know you're doing? You see, it all comes back, it all comes back to an understanding of yourself and a realization about what is my true reality. If I didn't know better, what would I want from people? Well, of course, I would want them eventually to help me learn, but you can't learn what you're not capable of seeing. If you're not vibrating on that level where it makes sense to you, doesn't matter how clearly it's explained. And I realized about the other person in the, in the little story I was living through, given their understanding, he did the best he could. So then I transferred all the annoyance to me because I felt culpable. And then one day I said, oh, given my understanding, I did the best I could. You see, a certain humility and self-honesty is required here. Humility and self-honesty are actually the same thing. Humility is not saying you're terrible, because after all, you might be quite talented. In fact, you might even be a very good person. But humility is just being willing to say, yeah, this is it. You know, this is the dark side of meditation. I am not even, not yet perfect. But I'm a, I'm a work in progress. But oh my, that self-forgiveness is in many ways even more difficult. 
So we have to put everything in proportion. That's where reincarnation is magnificently helpful. And that's where I have to see being in relationship to gurus, to teachers, to ascended masters, however you find it, really helps because if somebody else is there with you, and don't think for a moment that the mere fact that these great souls are not in their bodies in any way keeps them from being as close to you, more close to you than any other consciousness on the planet. And th the masters operate in this way. They're like lighthouses on a rocky shoal in a foggy night. And that's the best way to think about it. It just is there, beaming out that light. And we're making our way through the waves and the rocks and the fog, and we just can't quite tell where we're trying to go. And then, instead of looking, let's use the word down, down in meditation, Tandava has been leading us to look out through the window of the spiritual eye, raise your eyes slightly above the horizon. When we're thinking about the past, when we're thinking about, um, you know, what holds us, what, what, what diminishes us, we always drop our eyes. And in fact, in meditation, if your mind wanders, pay attention, you'll see that your eyes have dropped. And one of the ways to get your concentration back is simply lift them above the horizon. It sounds ridiculously simple, but it's the simple truth. And so we're always, we're looking down. And the angels are literally all around us, literally all around us, just begging us to look up. Another death and return story, fascinating. This woman tried to commit suicide. And she succeeded sufficiently to go into the astral world. Now, suicide is a big question. So I, I don't want to go into too much detail, but she went to the place where people who take their own lives were. And she saw a lot of people there, you know, in, in a much worse state than that American Indian, because they were all looking down. They were all just concentrated on everything that was making them miserable, and their worldview was completely circumscribed by their self-preoccupation. Because being preoccupied with that little self is the opposite of being uh, conscious of, of infinity. It's, it's just the polar opposite. So people who become so obsessed with their little universe that they take their own lives, they, what happens when your physical body dies, the great problem with suicide is it doesn't accomplish anything. It just affirms on a very profound level a, a, a mistake. The fact is it's only a mistake, and gradually you get through it. But this woman goes to this place, and she's there, and she sort of sees suddenly how trapped these people are and deeply regrets what she's done. And I believe she wasn't a, spirit, wasn't a religious or a spiritual person, but the thought of Jesus came into her mind. Just literally, the word Jesus came into her mind. Not a big revelation of my Savior or anything, just the word Jesus. It crossed her mind, it caused her to look up. I mean, it's an incredible story, and really in its simplicity. She looked up, she realized just above her were hundreds of angels. And they were all there, beaming their light, trying to get the attention. And when she looked up, suddenly she came out. And she just sailed up and then, in fact, came back into her body and then spent a, the rest of her life, you know, talking to people about many things related to this, including the influences that had gotten her there in the first place. Amazing, isn't it? Almost chilling. Really. But that's, that's our story. We get to look down as long as we want to. And all around us are, is the lighthouse. And it's just a question. What, watch yourself when you're suffering. And the reason uh, hell is considered to be eternal is because when you're in it, it is. Isn't that so? If it's five minutes, ten minutes, wherever you are, when, once it's gotten you, you just think it's never going to end. And the only thing that helps you remember that's going to end is the vague memory that it did the last time. That you weren't there forever, whether it's weeping your eyes out, being enraged. Sooner or later, what happens? 
the will to live, the indomitable spirit of the human heart, our own desire for happiness just pulls us out of it. You can only cry for so long. You can cry for a long time, but only so long. Then you just become exhausted. There's a marvelous title for a country western song. I have tears in my ears from lying on my back, crying my eyes out over you. <laughs> if you do cry on your back, you actually find that your ears do fill up. <laughs> I mean, it's not funny when it's happening, believe me. <laughs> but it doesn't hurt to laugh about it afterwards. Because that's what gets you through. Somewhere or another, some little bit of light comes through. And yes, eventually you have to forgive everybody. Not for their sakes, but for yours. It's just like that. What, how is this serving me? Where will this take me? At some point you have to say, well, very simply, it's their karma, it's not mine. I had this realization recently. I was reacting very strongly to something that was happening, other people's behavior, and I thought, suddenly just crossed my mind. This has nothing to do with me. This is impacting me. You know, this is impacting me. But this isn't really about me. You know, I, it just, it's happened around me and now I'm impacted, but it's their karma. And why should I make it mine? Because it becomes yours when you want it to be different. You see, we come back to the revolt. Repeatedly we come back to the revolt. But then you have to ask a very, very, very brave question, which is, why is this happening to me? <clears throat> and God knows Really terrible things happen to people, happen to innocent people, happen to children. But children, and I know this is tough, children are not innocent because you had a previous incarnation. There was this little girl met Swami Kriyananda and uh, Swami was a, a very interesting character because, you know, of course, he had an, his body aged in a normal way. But his spirit was so indefinable. I think this child, she was about seven or eight, he just, she just couldn't get him into the right box. He just didn't fit. He looked like her grandfather, but he wasn't. And, and she just kept sort of staring at him, kind of inching closer and closer. Finally, she was just about right here, and she said, how old are you anyway? Just like this. And he looked right into her eyes, and he said, let's put it this way. When you were an old woman, I was a little boy. <laughs> and she looked puzzled for a minute and then said, ah, she said and walked away. <laughs> but that's the truth, isn't it? Now, I'm not saying a very terrifying fact for people that as you sow, so shall you reap. But the question you ask is, what good thing is going to come to me or is coming to me through this experience? It takes great honesty to be able to answer that. I've been through some very tough things in my life, and when I finally asked what good thing is coming to me, I had to realize I would not be so motivated without this experience. So if you're highly motivated to transform yourself in a way that will be the end of all your suffering, is this a bad thing? Now, if you only take it to make you smaller and more angry, all that means is you're not learning yet. Now, that is a very, very tough assignment. I accept that it's a very tough assignment. That's why most people don't really try to transcend the ego. They just try to organize the world to support it. You know, which is a step, rather than just being passive and dull, to try to make the world to control the world, that was the suggestion, uh, Kavita's suggestion. She just wanted to be able to control things a lot more. How is that going to work for you, right? That's how we start. We first think, I will organize the world for my pleasure and my comfort. And I don't know whether it's good or bad karma to have that work. <laughs> it's good in the sense that we begin to understand that we are not a victim, we are in charge. And that's, that's progress. That's, you know, before you learn algebra, you have to learn to add. I am not a victim, I am in charge. But then we have to learn the limits of our influence. And that's why these 
very challenging things happen. Either somebody with more power than us just takes our power from us, or the whole thing just dissolves. The government changes, the economy shifts, the technology takes away my profession. Plastic bags are out loud in Mountain View, California, and what happens to all the plastic bag makers in China? I don't know. But over and over again, and then we ask, God, why is this happening to me? And for me, personally, learning God's will for me was learning, has been learning, what am I afraid of? Invariably, when I'm so confused as to why God is asking me, there's always, for me, I think for most people, fear at the heart of that confusion. I just don't want to know. I don't want this to be true. And often it's, I don't want to be that good. I want somebody to apologize to me. I want somebody to say, I know your attitude stinks, but that's okay. Like this. And the more we come to peace with this, I'm going to give you one more story on this and then we'll go somewhere else. Uh, for many years, I was in a position where we took groups of people to India. Over about 20 years, we did it about a dozen times. Mostly Americans, almost always Americans. Almost always, they'd never been to India. Usually, they'd never been to any non-developed country. So the whole thing, and we started in 1986. So the whole country of India is completely different now than it was when we started. When we started, it was closed to foreign corporations, so it was just a whole different world there. In the middle of our sojourn, it shifted. Now it's like, the last time I was in India, the night before we left, we went out, and I'm not kidding you, to a restaurant called Fat Lulu's, and had really excellent Italian pizza. <laughs> I mean, just like, what country am I in? You really forget. But at the beginning, it wasn't like that. And people saw a lot of things that you never saw in, our, in America ever. You certainly don't see it in New Zealand. You know, like being in this five-star hotel and then we're there for five days and we're watching the family that lives on this, the sidewalk. You know, we're up on that seventh floor and we're just looking down and we're watching their whole little life there. They live in about, you know, three square meters and they have their life. We watch them sleep, we watch them wake up, we watch them make their food. It just, and, and you, you get on and off the bus and you're besieged by beggars and it's just, it was, it was an adventure. And it was very interesting to me how differently people responded. My responsibility in the tour, I'm not any good at logistics. And so my job was the people. And I was the one that, I mean, one of the ones, not the only, but I would have to help people through all the cultural shocks and so on. But doing that a lot of times, we took hundreds of people to India by the end of the, that cycle. I really observed that people had, a, had very wildly varying reactions to watching other people struggle. And it wasn't because of the kindness of their hearts. Our tour was based on this spiritual path and these holy places, so nobody went on that trip who was a selfish person. They were all very compassionate, very tender people. And some just sailed right through it. You know, just dealt with the beggars just easily and everything, and others were just overwhelmed. The difference I began to figure out, and I believe this was true, was the degree to which a person had understand, understood the positive role of suffering in their own life. And if a person had come to a positive understanding that difficult circumstances are often not only beneficial, but essential to bring positive result, then they were able to look with equanimity on other people who are going through difficult circumstances and just recognize a kindred spirit. You know, completely different situation, but this underlying understanding that we are all on a journey. Add karma, add reincarnation, add a lot of other things, and the whole picture fills out. But the essential response was a feeling one, and then reason would follow feeling. Oh, I'm just looking at someone who's learning what they need to learn. I'm not looking at some great aberration. And that panic was almost always a reflection of their own panic. Now, another question I was asked here, how can we best serve humanity? Well, I think the best way to serve humanity is courage in the face of challenge. And how can you have courage in the face of challenge if you don't have courage in the face of challenge? Because what is it that people want from you? They just want 
I mean, it's not like they necessarily want solutions, answers, management, you know, advice. Often people, that's the last thing they want to hear from you. But they just need a little support going through it. I have a couple of friends in my life who are just, I mean, an absolute pure gift from God. It doesn't matter how I screw up. They never lose faith and courage that I'm going to get it worked out. They may be as exasperated as everyone else, but they believe in me, and they're not afraid. Just think about that. Somebody who's not afraid, not afraid of your suffering. Not keen on it, but not afraid of it, because they understand you're going where you need to go. Because of our teaching, I have a certain understanding of death, and I actually, I mean, this sounds weird. I love death. Death is very interesting to me, and I'm very happy to be involved when it's the end of someone's life and I need to help them through it. It doesn't frighten me. I think it's a wonderful transition and I was about to say, heaven knows we're all going to face it, aren't we? It was a huge motivator to put me on the path when I was 18. I realized that no matter what I built up, no matter how many people loved me, no matter at that time I thought I would have lots of children and you know I would die surrounded by children and grandchildren and God knows how many generations would all be sitting there at my last moment. But I realized sooner or later they were all going to go away and I would be absolutely alone. What would, what would that be? What would that be like? It was a huge motivator for me to understand what that solitude is and not just try to mask it. So as a consequence, and because of the life I've lived, I've been involved with a number of people literally as they took their last breath. And I don't, ha- I don't bring much to it. I can't travel with them to the astral world. I don't have that kind of power. I certainly can't heal them, but I'm not afraid either. It's like, it's, it's fine. You've had a great run, or you've had a terrible run, but whatever it is, it's done now. You know, you're leaving home. You're going off to the next phase. Let's just, let's just embrace it. And I've just seen just not being afraid. My goodness, that adds a lot. But how can you not be afraid if you are afraid? So what can we do to help humanity? It's to just gradually, step by step, you know, with determination, face, and with the grace of God, see the lighthouse and sail for the lighthouse instead of just going around in circles in the fog. Of course, we can go around in circles in the fog as long as we want to. I lived with Swami Kriyananda, I just, my, my. I mean, what he saw, what he, I don't want to use the word endured, (laughs) but what he endured, he would just, he would get this look on his face, just of supreme patience. He would sort of stare off into the middle distance. There was a certain silence he would sometimes offer you, not a corrective, just a silence. That would cause you to think, oh boy, what did I do? And, you'd, and then you'd have to find it, how you had just, you know, taken your eyes off the light and wandered off to the other side. He would just wait, just as patiently as he could be. I was with him once in Reno, Nevada, which is not quite as famous as Las Vegas, but it's real close. And we actually had the talk, if I'm not mistaken, in a room it might have even, we had to walk through the casino to get to the room. It might have been a different event that we did that. And he was talking to a group of people who had, it was somebody else's church, and they were not exactly on his wavelength. You know, they, they really were not ready, is a word I could use. They, were, they had the good karma to hear him, but they weren't going to go as far as he could take them. But he went into some really uh, elevated state, and there were about 50 people in the room, and he stood there, and each one of them came up to him afterwards, and I was standing about there just watching. And I just had this feeling, how many incarnations have these same souls come in front of either him personally or just the light? And I believe, that actually, I spoke to him about this afterwards, so I know my intuition was correct. He, 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 it's like each one held up a cup of a certain size, and they held up that cup, and he filled it. And you know, and some of the cups were really small. And, and, and some of them were shaped in a particular way that only certain things could be put in them. You know, I mean, they were just walking, hello, thank you so much, it was a nice talk, that kind of thing. But it was this whole other dimension that was happening. 
which is we're just moving forward. But what impressed me was not merely that, but how completely at peace Swami Kriyananda was. He wasn't afraid of what these people had to go through. And if you're not afraid, you behave correctly. You know, Tandava raised that question last night. That was his, his comment. You know, I want to be confident in my responses. Well, the only way we can be confident in our responses is if we're absolutely resting in the center of ourself. Because what confuses our responses is when reason follows feeling. And what confuses our responses above all is fear. And just to have the perfect confidence that, yes, you are miserable right now, aren't you? But you'll figure it out. You'll figure it out. And when you do, won't that freedom be worth every bit of it? Now what does that come down to? Whether or not we have seen that in our own lives and are at peace with it. Does that make sense? That's the greatest gift you can give. And here's the last piece of this. In the Bible it says, perfect love casts out all fear. Fear has one antidote. And that antidote is love. That antidote is loving the people around you, but above all, it's both receiving and giving that divine love. Because when you stand in that, then there is nothing anywhere. No fierce thing on this planet can shake your equanimity even for a second, because you're seeing it all from that divine point of view. And this ultimately is where that courage comes from. Oh, God loves us. And this whole seeming drama is really for one purpose, is for us to open enough to receive it and then become pure channels to give it. Now, I think that's something worth doing. Everything else is going to go away anyway, but that one is ours forever. So, okay. Let's have a little music. Then we'll... Do we have a meditation before lunch, or do we just have lunch? Okay, so let's have a little music and then maybe a few minutes of meditation and then we'll go on.
Tommy Creedondo, when he was in the Holy Land many years ago, um, you know, there's a lot of tourists running all around there, but he just got in the center and went deeper and deeper. He called it spiritual archaeology, kind of down through all those layers of history, <coughs> the original inspiration of Jesus walking the lands there. Later, when he got back home, he just felt the inspiration from God to write a whole oratory, which is like Handel's Messiah, but it's called the Oratorio Christ Lives. And this is just one song for them.
Okay, since I should mention John Anderson. This is Robert Burns poem about the couple who goes through life together and reflecting on that. And applies to us too in our divine adventure. So this is the Scottish words originally. It's from the music and then American words. <laughs> Almost. <laughs> <laughs> this is how long we get silence. 